What's up, everybody? Draft season is finally upon us once again, so I'm going to start breaking down some of my favorite prospects as we get closer and closer to the 2016 NFL Draft later this April. First up, perhaps most appropriately, is the guy that I feel like has been getting the most unnecessary amount of criticism out of anyone in this entire class so far. Of course, Penn State quarterback Christian Hackenberg. If you just go on ESPN and look at his stats, it's pretty easy to hate everything about him as a quarterback prospect. He only threw for 53% completions, he regularly put routine short passes into the bleachers or onto the turf, and he was sacked more than any other quarterback in the nation over the course of the last two seasons. Just going off box scores, Hackenberg is a very, very underwhelming quarterback prospect. However, box scores never tell the whole story when it comes to football, which is where so much of the confusion and divisiveness about Hackenberg comes from. Not to bury the lead here, but I love him as a prospect despite all of the ugly statistics. Mentally, he's an NFL quarterback. When you watch him at the line of scrimmage, you can still see the Bill O'Brien influences in him from his freshman year. You can still see why so many coaches are excited by him. He's a brain. Some college quarterbacks are track stars, some are gunslingers. Christian Hackenberg is a brain. And that was apparent in the season opening game against Temple more than any other game this season. Now I know what you're gonna say, wait a minute. He was sacked 10 times by the Temple defense threw for barely 100 yards, only had 44% completions, threw an interception without tossing any touchdowns. Statistically, that game was horrible, but again, the box score never tells the whole story. To put it briefly, this may have been the worst performance by an offensive line I have ever seen in my entire life at any level of football. At one point, Temple got to Hackenberg with just a two-man rush, and there was literally nothing he could do about it. They got him a couple times with green dog blitzes and other pressure packages that are pretty tough to identify pre-snap, but for at least seven or eight of those sacks out of 10, it was all in the disgraceful offensive line losing one-on-one -on -one battles and pass protection. The biggest challenge Hackenberg faced when it came to all that pressure though, was probably the Owls defensive philosophy itself. Schematically speaking, Temple's mindset going into every game is to fill aggressively against the run on early downs to force third and long situations. And then once they get there, unleash some of the most outrageously complex pressure packages you'll ever see in college football. It's a very, very antagonistic scheme against both the run and the pass. You've heard of pro-style offenses. This is a pro-style defense that really takes a lot of its influences from the great blitz-heavy Steelers and Eagles defenses of Dick LeBeau and Jim Johnson. It's all pressure, all the time, and behind those blitzes are constant coverage rotations that never really let a quarterback get comfortable. If you keep the run game involved and avoid third and long, they tend to ease off the gas pedal, and that was usually when teams could score against them. But if you fall behind against Temple in this scheme, you're in for a long, long day. Unfortunately for Hackenberg, Penn State fell in that hole early in the second half, and he had to deal with all their mind games at the line of scrimmage for the rest of the afternoon. That being said, though, watching Hackenberg go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this Temple defense pre-snap on every play was basically football heaven for an X's and O's guy like myself. They came into this game knowing that Hackenberg likes to make adjustments at the line, find favorable matchups, and exploit them. So every time he made a call, they immediately started playing shell games on defense to throw him off. Punch, counterpunch, four straight quarters, all day long. It was awesome to watch all that gamesmanship and even better to see how Hackenberg tried to answer those shifts post-snap. Great example here, second quarter, Penn State had some success early with the run game with fly sweeps and jumped out to a quick lead, but Temple really clamped down after those first few drives and started matching Hackenberg's brains with their own. The Owls are in their base personnel, but technically it's really nickel because their outside linebacker, number six, Stephon Marshall, is only 200 pounds, so he's really just an extra DB that happens to be labeled as a linebacker. Anyway, they're lined up in an odd front, meaning only three down linemen, with kind of an ambiguous look coverage-wise on the back end. Marshall, the linebacker, could be dropping into an underneath zone. He could bail out of that and take the slot receiver in man, because he's certainly quick enough to handle that at that size. Or he could be a free blitzer off the edge. 
the safety's capping over that slot receiver, which is a huge red flag that Marshall's gonna be blitzing while the safety takes him in man. Hackenberg doesn't know what's coming because it could be anything, so he gives a hard count to get Temple to jump into their shell and clarify the picture for him. Great veteran move by him. When he gives that count, Marshall shows his hand as the rusher off the edge. Hackenberg immediately IDs the blitz and points it out. He's got a play action screen dialed up here, which is already a perfect answer for that blitz because he's got two on two left outside, which means he just needs to get his guy to pick up a block and beat one tackler in space, and that's a touchdown. Temple then responds with a shift, trying to change that picture on him again. Hackenberg snaps it, the screen's still on, and he's sacked immediately when his left tackle gets beaten off the edge. Once a quarterback as smart as Hackenberg figures out the answers to their pressure packages, Temple always wants to give him something different, or at the very least give the appearance of something different, so that he never feels comfortable. Very few college defenses do these kinds of last second shifts, because they require extraordinary communication and usually a lot of experience playing together, which is pretty hard to come by at the college level. Now let's back it up. After that defensive shift, Hack points out the new front. You can see the strong safety creep down towards the line of scrimmage while the linebacker, Marshall, goes out into the slot to cover receiver man-to-man. -man. Hack points it out, but Temple really didn't change a lot here. They just moved a bunch of pieces all over the place to screw with protections to get Hackenberg second-guessing the picture in front of him, but really all they did was just have the safety and linebackers switch places. Now the safety is going to be blitzing off the edge, and the linebackers in coverage. It's the same blitz. They still have a two-on-two -two in coverage outside. They just flip the personnel to mess with the quarterback. The play call that Hackenberg has on here is still the right call, and he knows it because he still sees through that shift. It's still two-on-two -two outside. It's a play-action wide receiver screen, and that run fake is meant to draw in that slot defender and the blitzing safety and freeze them while they read their run pass keys, which ideally will then allow the wide receiver enough time to get space on the edge and take it to the house. Very low risk, high reward type of play against a blitz as long as that protection holds up. Now, that being said, the run fake aspect of this play kind of backfired a bit and actually gave Marshall enough time to get in a good position to make a play on this ball and coverage but Hackenberg has a strong enough arm that I still think he could fit it into his receiver if he placed it well enough high and about the 31 yard line. If he did fit it in there, there's a decent chance that's an instant touchdown. Instead, the left tackle gets smoked and we never even get a chance to see him try to beat that coverage in the first place. Hackenberg made the right read, had the right call against the right defense. His offensive line just let him down like they did all season long. You should never ever be sacked on a screen pass of all things, and yet he was because his left tackle and the offensive line in general was just that bad in 2015. Later in the quarter, Penn State trying to get points to end the first half. More mind games from Temple. Ackenberg's reading that pre-snap picture. Watch these Temple DBs and linebackers moving all over the place, constantly changing their shells. They never want to have Hackenberg be comfortable. What really matters here, though, is what the quarterback actually sees. Take a look at his helmet, give a little glance to his left. What he sees when he glances over there is the safety come down into the box while the corner goes back into man-to-man. -man. That's now clearly a two-on-two -two look outside, just like he got early in the quarter on the sack. That two-on-two -two look is Hackenberg's opening to do some damage. He may not have an offensive line at all, but he's got speed at the wide receiver position, and if you give one of his burners a one-on-one -on -one opportunity in space, he will make sure to punish you for it. So what does he do? Change the play to exploit that matchup. The same mentality that Bill O'Brien instilled in him from the beginning of his freshman year. If you look closely, you can see him give a little signal to his receivers out wide, patting the front of his face mask, and they acknowledge that signal to each other as well. As he's doing that, you can see Temple get spooked. They don't like that Hackenberg likes whatever he sees. So again, they change that picture on him to screw with him. The safety drops back out, and instead of bringing a blitz, they only rush three and have eight in coverage. The play that Hackenberg called for was a pump and go. It's a fake wide receiver screen where Deshaun Hamilton looks like he's blocking the corner outside, then releases upfield. It's a progression off the screen that they had earlier in the game. They want to try to get him to bite on it again. Ideally, the man covering Hamilton would bite on that fake screen, which would also be sold on the pump fake from Hackenberg, and if he bit on it, that would give Hamilton a window to get behind him cleanly and take it to the house for six. Again, if that blitz was left on by Temple and they kept it as a two-on-two -two situation outside, there's a decent chance that's a touchdown. Instead, they go conservative when they get spooked. Hack realizes that he's not going to get them with the pump and go, and he just throws it away. 
The announcers in this game said, quote, he airmailed it, which implies that he flat out missed his receiver, but really he's just throwing this one out of bounds and living to fight another down. It wasn't open, the play wasn't going to work, and he's not going to make a stupid throw into an unfavorable coverage if he didn't have to. Hackenberg made a brilliant check at the line to beat the coverage he was given, but Temple just made an even better counter check and screwed it all up for him. This right here, even though it's an incompletion, is an NFL caliber mental battle. It's a very smart quarterback going up against a very smart defense, and even though the defense won this one, it was still an awesome mental rep from Hackenberg that he put on tape, because I see that he's able to make those checks and put his team in a good position to win. Not a lot of college quarterbacks get to the line of scrimmage, survey defenses, give hard counts, get people to jump into their shell, ID blitzes, change protections, change plays, and then try to execute those plays with virtually no help from the rest of the team. That's exceedingly rare in college. And what's interesting is that even as a freshman, Hackenberg had even more control at the line of scrimmage under Bill O'Brien than he does right now under James Franklin. And he still had more control this year than the vast majority of collegiate level quarterbacks. That's how advanced he is from a mental standpoint. He's been doing this kind of stuff his entire life. Now against Temple, he threw 14 total incompletions out of 25 attempts. Again, that's a 44% completion percentage, which is awful in the box score. But by my charting, he really only missed five throws all game, and two of those misses were very, very close misses. Five legitimately missed throws is a little high, but not super egregious by any means for a quarterback. But on top of those, he also had to deal with two drops, one pass batted down at the line, one ball thrown away under pressure, two passes off the mark due to pressure or being hit as he released, one pass broken up on a good play by a defender, one catch being negated by a receiver not getting his feet in bounds, and one absolutely freakish one-handed interception by a defensive lineman who dropped out of nowhere into a throwing lane underneath. It was that kind of day. All total, those things make up 14 incompletions, but really only five of them were flat out misses by Hackenberg. The box score won't tell you that. As a result of Hackenberg's protection instantly breaking down on almost every dropback, he never really had time to punish Temple for leaving his wide receivers one-on-one -on -one deep downfield with no safety help. He kept getting killed before he ever had time to set his feet and launch it, and unsurprisingly, one of the few times he wasn't sacked, he's able to loft it up to Godwin for his biggest gain of the day. That was generally Penn State's game plan against blitz-happy defenses with Hackenberg at quarterback. That being to have six men in to protect, try to hold pocket integrity, and use Hackenberg's natural gifts to punish defenses deep for leaving all their speedy wide receivers in one-on-one -on -one matchups. It didn't work against Temple because they could never actually protect him long enough to throw it, but flash forward to the San Diego and Maryland games, and again, these are two defenses that were bringing a lot of blitzes and taking chances in man coverage, and Hackenberg was able to just ruthlessly punish them with his arm. He's got truly, truly tremendous arm talent. I don't think it's quite as strong as Ryan Mallett or even Jay Cutler, but he's certainly on par with Matt Stafford, Joe Flacco, and Aaron Rodgers. I mean, he can flat out rip it. So why wouldn't you use all that natural arm talent to just get over the top of defenses that insist on playing man-free coverage? That's what I would do. Maryland actually got a taste of both Hackenberg's pre-snap brain and his post-snap arm talent a few times. First quarter, Hack gives them another hard count to get them to jump into their shell. You can hear it on the broadcast, but for our purposes, you can see a few guys in the front seven twitch a bit from the count, but nobody outright jumps. Now off screen, he must have seen something to tip him off to what specific pressure was coming based on his film study, whether it was a coverage roll from the safeties or something like that, I'm not sure, it happened off screen. But he immediately ID'd the blitz and pointed out that the boundary side corner was coming after he gave that hard count. You can see the offensive tackle turn to that corner immediately after Hack pointed it out, so this blitz was sniffed out before the ball was even snapped. Maryland is a much less experienced defense than Temple though, so they weren't using nearly as many pre-snap shell games to disguise everything, and they certainly weren't changing the picture on them every single snap. If Temple's defense is chess, Maryland's is checkers for an experienced quarterback like Hackenberg that can already read defenses at the line extremely well. Post snap, the corner gets picked up by the tackle. He's got one on one with Godwin against the safety and takes his shot. The ball was left further inside than I'd like to see on a nine route, but Godwin's actually really good at tracking in deep balls, so it wasn't a huge issue for him to make that catch. Speaking of Godwin, he's not a complete receiver in the mold of Allen Robinson by any means when he was at Penn State a few years ago, 
but as a pure deep threat, he makes catches like this one all the time. He's kind of like Devin Smith from Ohio State a year ago, so I like the decision to trust him on that shot play. Now also on the subject of the Maryland game, when they left their corners alone and packed the box, it was actually clear to me that their game plan revolved around stopping Saquon Barkley and taking their chances with Hackenberg when they needed to. Barkley was Penn State's true freshman running back who, even at this young age, was a complete revelation in that backfield. This offense could not get anything done without him because he was the only running back on the roster who could still consistently get yards despite having terrible, terrible blockers up front. He made everything so, so much easier on the quarterback, and I think the fact that he didn't really get any snaps in the Temple game is part of the reason why the offense didn't do anything after the first few drives. The week before that Maryland game, Barkley tore up Ohio State in prime time. The same Buckeyes defense that's starting 11 is pretty much entirely made up of NFL prospects was destroyed by this kid. As good as Zeke Elliott looked in that game, Barkley looked even better. So Maryland saw him take OSU to the woodshed the week before and made it their mission the next week to not let the same thing happen to them. And you know what, it probably would have worked if Hackenberg didn't keep throwing bomb after bomb after bomb all game long to punish them for stacking that box against Barkley in the first place. Play action was that defense's worst nightmare in this game. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that play action is Hackenberg's bread and butter. When he's under center and making three, five, seven step drops, faking handoffs, doing half rolls, all that pro style kind of footwork, he is way, way more mechanically sound, and as a result, way more accurate. Look at his feet on the touchdown throw in the third quarter, very clean five step drop from under center. That third step covers a lot of ground to get depth. He's shifting his weight forwards as he takes the fourth step, and his fifth step is at a perfect 45 degree angle to finish the drop and keep him balanced so that he can immediately step into the throw. He takes a big hit as he releases, but is placed perfectly back shoulder underneath the coverage, and Hamilton reaches in for the TD. That is spotless pro-style footwork and great toughness on the delivery. Under Bill O'Brien, who ran a pro-style offense during his stint as the Penn State head coach, that was what Hackenberg was doing all the time. Under James Franklin, though, working under center is kind of a side dish to the main course that is pistol and shotgun formations. When Hackenberg's in the pistol or the gun, his feet tend to get incredibly lazy, infuriatingly lazy even. It's kind of like without those drop steps from under center to remind him to actually keep his feet moving, he forgets to move them at all. Those lazy feet, in my opinion, were far and away his biggest problem when it came to accuracy out of the pistol and shotgun formations. He sailed this curl against Maryland, for instance, and a lot of people look at that and say, how does this keep happening? How is he so inconsistent on short passes? He must be awful. But when you look at where his plant foot's pointing on the throw, he's got it cocked towards the sideline. It's almost parallel with the yard markers, and as a general rule of quarterbacking, the ball's going to go wherever your plant foot's pointed. So if your plant foot is pointed out of bounds because your footwork is super lazy, then guess where the ball's going to land? It's not hard to figure out that Hackenberg spending more time in the pistol and shotgun under James Franklin directly correlated to his drop in completion percentage since Bill O'Brien left town. There were flashes of good footwork from the gun, very good flashes actually, so I know he can do it, I know he's done it in the past. He would keep his feet active, knees were bent, very light in the pocket, but then the next snap and pistol he'd go back to that lazy footwork again and sail one of the bleachers. It was so frustrating to watch him be so perfect under center and look like a first overall pick and so mechanically clunky everywhere else. He developed a ton of bad habits under Franklin and I think it speaks to the quality of coaching that he's received, to be honest, or lack of quality really, since Bill O'Brien left. Priority number one for him this offseason before the combine, before pro days, before all that, is to fix his footwork and quicken his release. He's got a bit of a windup to him, and I personally think that needs to be tuned up a little bit. He's still got kind of that baseball throwing motion left in him from when he was a pitcher in high school, so that needs to go away. That being said, Jameis Winston also had a ton of footwork and release issues last year coming out of Florida State, but those mostly got fixed before he even went to the combine, so I'm not too worried about Hackenberg fixing those as well. You can drill footwork into someone a hell of a lot quicker than you can teach them how to ID blitzes, call their own protections, or throw a dart 40 yards downfield on the run. Unfortunately, when he gets to the combine though, people are still going to look at those box scores and question his ability. They're still going to say, well, he only threw for 120 yards against Ohio State. And I'll say, yeah, he did, because he only attempted 13 passes in the entire game. In the entire third quarter of that OSU matchup, across three different possessions, he attempted a total of two passes. 
One of them was on the first play of the half and it went for a huge gain. The other was a touchdown. For whatever reason in this game, run-pass balance simply did not exist for John Donovan, who at the time was the offensive coordinator, which is partially why Penn State fans despised him as a coordinator, and he was let go before the season was even over. After Ohio State, next we'll look at Northwestern and say, wait a minute, in that game, didn't Hackenberg start 1 of 10? 10% completion? And I'll say, yeah, because three of his first 10 passes were deflected at the line of scrimmage one of which bounced off a referee, and that would have been a first down. Another three incompletions were due to drops or receivers running routes incorrectly, and one incompletion was simply a really damn good pass breakup on a slant by an all-Big Ten corner. Only two out of those first nine incompletions against Northwestern were actually misplaced passes by Hackenberg, but again, the box score won't tell you that. It'll just say incomplete. And the people who made fun of him for starting one of ten shut up real quick when on his next ten passes, he hit nine of ten, with the only incompletion in that group being yet another drop by his tight end on an absolute dime of a throw downfield. If you take anything from this video, please never, ever try to determine a prospect's worth through statistics without looking at anything else. Stats can be useful, yes, I acknowledge that, but on their own, if you only look at them in a vacuum, they tend to be taken horribly, horribly out of context. Christian Hackenberg is the poster child for out of context statistics. It is January 19th right now as of the time of me recording this. And as of this week, I'm generally seeing Hackenberg being talked about as a day two prospect at best, with some people even being so bold as to label him a fourth round or fifth round reclamation project. I'm gonna tell you what's about to happen in the next few months. Hackenberg's going to get to the combine in February, he's going to have improved footwork, he's going to throw a beautiful ball in drills with excellent velocity, he's going to measure with great size and test well as an athlete, he's going to interview extremely well, and coaches are going to get excited with his intelligence on the whiteboard and his work ethic off the field. People are going to go back and watch the tape again after that impressive combine, and they'll see the perfect throws he made across his body while on the run that his receivers dropped or that they couldn't drag a toe in bounds. That's lost yardage. They'll see the bad offensive line that he had to deal with and the receiving core that, while full of athleticism, had nobody that could really run great routes and just flat out get open when he needed them to most. He's gonna get every single team really excited over how much he did with so little. And when scouts get excited, the media gets excited. When the media gets excited, the fans get excited. Come draft day, this big, athletic, super smart pro style quarterback with a great work ethic, great leadership, and a cannon for an arm is gonna get taken in the first round and nobody will be less shocked than I am. He's a first round prospect. He's always been a first round prospect. And if he somehow slips anywhere remotely near Bill O'Brien's pick at 22nd overall, you bet he'll take him with a giant smile on his face and wonder why the hell he wasn't already off the board. He'll go to Houston, the media will make fun of him, post the same useless stats that I just talked about, and then Bill O'Brien's going to do what Bill O'Brien does and make him a Pro Bowl quarterback. Keep in mind that as a Texan, Hackenberg would finally have a good offensive line, he'd have a stud wide receiver in DeAndre Hopkins to throw to, he'd have an awesome defense to cover up for his mistakes, and most importantly, he'd have a quarterback guru of a head coach that has proven time and time again that he can make even bad quarterbacks look at least somewhat average. And for God's sake, the guy got a win with TJ Yates, Brandon Whedon, Ryan Mallett, and Brian Hoyer all in the same season. I dare you to find another coach who can do that. Now imagine what he could turn someone as gifted as Hackenberg into in just a few years. It's going to happen, okay? It's inevitable. It's going to happen. And when it does happen, just remember that I told you about it in January. All right, that's all I got for today. This was obviously a longer video than usual, but it all really needed to be said. There's just too much misplaced criticism of Hackenberg right now, and that narrative needs to change. In my next video, I'll have uh, my favorite defensive prospect in the draft, Jalen Smith, who unfortunately, due to a horribly ill-timed knee injury in his bowl game, now has some of the most unpredictable draft stock in this entire class. Until then, later. Later.